Hey, 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 Closet Busters, come on and gather around. It's time once again to kick down those closet doors of life. We're here to escape our BS, explore our fears, and elevate our self-expression. I'm your host, Rick Clemens, Bold Move Expert and Coming Out Coach, and I'm going to take you to the party, the pulpit, the wake, and back to the party of living your life uncloseted. So come on, grab hold of yourself and get ready to step out, step up, and step in to living your truth as we explore more stories, tips, and tricks for living your life uncloseted. Now let's get to the show. Hey there, Closet Busters and Bold Move Makers. This is Life Uncloseted, where we say, screw it. I'm going to kick down those closet doors of my life. I'm going to set myself free. And you know what? I'm just going to live my life uncloseted without any apologies to anyone. I'm Rick Clemens, the Bold Move Maker, and I'm the host of the show. And you know what? What I've learned about living life uncloseted is sometimes it takes crashing and burning to find your path to freedom and to, well, honestly, living a life uncloseted. And that crash can take on many forms. It could mean, you know, losing a relationship, leaving a record label. It could not even mean walking away from something that just isn't serving you before you realize that you are truly growing up and becoming older and wiser. Now, all those things are really good in their own way, but how do you find that path? And, you know, how do you see that light? I know sometimes we're blinded by, okay, we can't get there, but, you know, sometimes it just takes asking yourself the question, how do you take that dose of wisdom? And move away from relationships and things that are just wrong for you. Well, today I've got a pretty special guest who's released a new song. He's about a few weeks into having his new music video out. He's singer-songwriter Billy Wynn. He shares his own uncloseted journey with us today. His new single is called Crash. And we're going to explore just how he found ways to uncomplicate his life by allowing the crashes in his life to bring him to a place of rebirth, to rise out of the wreckage. So it's time for me to shut up and let's just bring Billy on. Billy, welcome to the show, man. <laughs> you being here. Rick, thank you for having me up today. Oh, absolutely, man. So exciting times for you, post-crash and burn. I think we're all crashing and burning in different ways. There's a lot of good stuff happening for you. The new single, Crash, is out, and you got the new music yeah. video. But all of that good stuff kind of came out of some crashes and, and burning, right? Absolutely. The new single is out. It's called Crash, and the response has been really amazing. I'm always surprised when people respond so positively to something, especially when it comes from someone who hasn't been around Mm -hmm. in a little while. Crash is my first major release in about two years, which in music industry time is really a long time. Mm -hmm. And so far, the response has been amazing. response to the video has been amazing. Everybody really seems to love it. So I'm really excited about this record and what it's been doing. And it's definitely come out of a sort of crash and burn situation. Like I said, it was, it's the first major release since I left my record label. So, yeah. So take us a little bit into that. I mean, you know, I know for many, many singer songwriters, you know, moving from label to label, that in and of itself can be some really, really scary stuff. And I know when I was preparing for this interview, it was a tough decision. It was a big decision for you. So take us a little bit into, you know, what was that piece that was guiding you to that and how has it helped you really, truly start to live into your fullest potential by leaving your record label? I think, you know, being in the, the midst of the fallout, we'll call it, it was hard to see clearly like what exactly the end result would be or, or you know, why I was going through what I was going through with the label. I signed with Kaleidosphere in 2014. And, you know, it was the sort of dream come true kind of idea of of having this really great song that I really, really love. The record they were interested in was Future Ex-Boyfriend. And there were a few others that I ended up giving them in the process. And, you know, having this record and having this label and thinking that, you know, finally it was going to go to that place that I always sort of wanted to go and it didn't happen in that way for a multitude of reasons and at the time I just didn't really understand like why things were going so wrong but at the end of the day I think the experience has really shown me a lot about what this industry can really be like and all of the things that people don't say I think is the thing that really has stuck with me the most is like yeah 
we will, you know, we'll send you this place and you'll do this and you'll do all these great things. But it's the things that, that aren't being said and mm -hmm. that <laughs> are sort of, you know, not symbolic, but we'll say that don't appear in writing yeah. that sort of happen. And you're like, you know, how the fuck did this happen? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, this is not what I was told, but right. at the end of it, I think that the biggest obstacle was not walking away from the situation with the label, but was trying to figure out how I was going to achieve my goal. Because at no point was I ever like, okay, I'm done with this. Like, this isn't working. I want to do, you know, I'm going to try and do something else. I still felt very much like, okay, this is just another bump in the road. I just need to sort of, we'll say, put some dynamite down and bust uh -huh. through it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it keep going. And that was the biggest thing is trying to figure out, okay, where exactly do I place this dynamite so that I can you know, blow up this obstacle and then just sort of keep going in the direction that I'm trying to go in. And the two years since the last release, which would have been in 2015, I really just spent that time restructuring the business side of things because being an independent artist, and I don't care what kind of independent artist you are, like you always have to be well aware and, and, and cognizant mm -hmm. of your business. Yeah. And so restructuring the business side of things and then also deciding where I wanted to go artistically, musically, you know, mm -hmm. what the next step would be and, and what that would look like. Yeah, has all definitely been like a really enlightening experience, good, bad, and indifferent. You know, it's interesting that you, you know, because, I mean, I guess I've never really thought of this, but when you become an independent artist, you really become an entrepreneur. You know, we talk about entrepreneurs all the time, but then suddenly when you, I think even when you're with a label or someone, you're still kind of an entrepreneur because you're still paving your own path. But suddenly when that rug gets quote unquote yanked out from under you, it's like, okay, now I'm the one driving the cart. And I think a lot of people miss this piece that, you know, every artist that's out there that may be a painter, a sculptor, a singer, a dancer, whatever it may be that they do artistically, a huge percentage of them are truly entrepreneurs. They're driving their own cart. They're figuring this out until they get, the deal you know and then even yeah, then there's like still a little are, bit of it you are the business exactly and it takes a while i've become business savvy just because of having to do this but a few years ago i would not have considered myself to be a business savvy person like I, that was like the very idea of it just doesn't even register to me mm -hmm. or it didn't i'm totally an artist totally a creative mind like that's how i think about things but the more involved on the business side that I got with this, you know, sort of post realizing that I wasn't going to be able to work with, with the label anymore and sort of being in a place where I'm not sure if I want to really get back in bed with another label. Mm -hmm. I started to think more about the business side of what it was that I was doing and to think about myself more as a commodity and as a brand and not just as, an artist so you definitely become an entrepreneur or at least you should think about yourself in yeah. that way when you do something like this you know it's really interesting because as you were just speaking through that whole thing of you know now i'm the business and i'm you know you're doing all these different things it's just another piece of the journey of uncloseting ourselves i know for me it's been the last few years that i really began to realize that i'm the brand it's just part of it life uncloseted the coming out lounge which we used to have as the podcast those were me as well, but they're just pieces of the puzzle. But in reality, I'm the brand. I'm also the entrepreneur. I'm also the CEO. All these things are who I am. And if any of those things are struggling or in a closet of some sort, it's going to affect the overall brand. And so it's always a big thing for me to sit back and go, even you know, before we started recording this podcast, I was working on some business stuff. <laughs> which I don't enjoy doing, but it's part of what makes you the brand and what, you know, keeps you out of these crazy closets of, Oh my God, this just drives me nuts. You got to go do this stuff in order to really be successful. Man, you know, you, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you said something else that was really interesting about it's not what people aren't saying. It's, you know, the unspoken stuff as you were talking about that, it just, took me back to, and it may, you know, bring you back to some of your own journey as a gay man as well, but it took me back to many things that I've realized throughout the years that we worry about what people are going to say, 
so much of the time, whether it's about coming out as an entrepreneur or coming out as a gay man or whatever it is, whatever these things are, you know, disclosing that we've got cancer, all these things that we think about what people are going to say, but we rarely think about the things that aren't being said until we realize that can actually be the more dangerous piece. And I'm just curious if that's kind of where you got to. Definitely with the label, that's exactly where I got to because to me, what it feels like was that everything that wasn't happening based on what I was told would happen was all based on the things that had not been said. And I can't really, you know, get yeah, into yeah. the sure. details of it. But just in general, know. this is the thing that stumps so many of us. You know, I was working with a client the other day who's in a career transition and it finally came to the surface that the company he's working with, they're like, yeah, we're just waiting for you to leave, which ironically was kind of what he was trying to hide was that he wanted to leave. And then once that hit him, he's like, it would have been so much easier if people would have just said that's what's going on if we both would have come to the table. But it's really hard when you're in those places because you don't know whether you should say something or whether you shouldn't. And then when you find out that something is being said, then you get affected as well. And I find it just really challenging when we don't open up and have these conversations, when we don't go into the real space. For me, that was definitely a huge part of it. You know, an example that I can give, which is pretty general, is like when even now, you know, like with Crash, okay, if I am going to, if I'm saying to you that I'm marketing Crash, I'm promoting this record, okay, well, that's what was said. What wasn't said, what I haven't said is, how I plan to do it. Right. That actually is the more effective part of it because how I may set out to promote this record might not be as effective as it possibly could be. And because I haven't said anything Mm -hmm. about it, now it's kind of, you know, just left up in the air as to what happens until it actually happens. And now it isn't working. You Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? It's like that kind of thing. And it was in those moments that I realized that, for me, it's what isn't being said that's having the most effect on what it is that I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. I was working with a client over the weekend around dating stuff. And and he said, um, well, I sent this guy a message and, you know, I'm not sure what to think about it. And so then he sent me the text messages so I could look at him and kind of wade through them with him. And so his message was, I think it'd be really nice if we went out for dinner again sometime. And the other guy replied back, yes, I think that would be lovely. And that was just kind of where it got set. And so my client's like, so I don't really know how to interpret that. I'm like, well, I think it's pretty clear. You both said it would be nice, but nobody said what needed to be said was, here's the date. Are you available? So the other person could say, yes, I'm interested in going. You know, it's these unsaid things that I think cause so much of the problem And then before we know it, we get bound up in our heads, we get bound up in our thoughts, and we don't really know what's going on. Instead of, man, how many times would life be so much better if we just said what we need to say and make it really clear? But I know, especially in the entertainment industry, that's not necessarily the way the game gets played. It's a big challenge. Yeah. I'm thankful that it happened, though, because now I realize, like, okay, is this how we want to do it? Then now I know going forward, like, you know, Mm-hmm. Just ask very direct questions. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> to kind of well, avoid those situations. But I think this is the beautiful thing of, you know, when we step out of these these challenging spots, these closets, whatever we want to label them, it's when the wisdom does step forward. And you're now seeing that, okay, now I'm a better person for this. And now I have my eyes much more wide open. I know what I want from my life. I know how to expect things. Doesn't mean we're 100% guaranteed, but when we get to do this, we have a better understanding of where things can go and how to better manage them. And I think that's Absolutely. what you're really learning in this beautiful moment. And yes, it may have taken a couple of years for you to kind of like, okay, let's get through this. But what I'm gathering, Billy, is you're coming out the other side much more just alive and well and able to see things and better prepared to take your career to the next level. Absolutely. I mean, that's as simple as I can possibly put it. I was talking to a producer friend of mine just a few days ago, and my exact words to him were, to see me earlier this year and to see me now as two completely different people, 
it was such a bitch year to start with mm -hmm. because of, you know, when you have a situation of this magnitude and, you know, again, running a business, you sort of put everything that you have into it. And when it's not going the way that you envision or the way that you need for it to go, it's such a fucking pain, mm -hmm. you know? And then, you know, being persistent and continuing on with it, of course, things just started to turn around. And so definitely we're seeing the other side of it now, finally. So thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. So let's kind of put this in a frame here. So what I'm hearing is there was a deep, dark space, you know, you were in, and now you're starting to see the light. So if you don't mind, give the audience one clear cut thing that you've learned about this journey of, okay, I'm stepping forward out of this closet of this career thing and really getting, what's something you've learned personally about yourself? through the last six, eight months? I think the thing that I've learned, the most important thing that I've learned is that you have to feel deserving of the things that you want. And what I mean by that is the whole situation made me feel as though I wasn't as good as I thought I was mm -hmm. or as good as I had been told that I was because it all seemed like it was crashing and burning and in a situation like this, it can seem like it's, it felt like it was my fault mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the point where, you know, I didn't feel like I deserved what it was that I was trying to achieve. And that's huge. I mean, that's a huge thing right there. And that's why I'm interrupting, because I think when we don't feel that we deserve, whether it's God, the universe, whatever your belief system, then it's going to say, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to give you what you deserve. It doesn't mean we're always going to get what we deserve, but until we buy into this, I mean, I can put this in my own frame right now. I've, you know, I've been struggling for a couple of years going, okay, I want to expand. I want to do something that takes these experiences of people coming out of the closet and take it to a wider audience. I kept thinking it's never going to happen. Then I quit believing that I could make it happen. And now here we sit, life on closet has just shifted from the coming out lounge but I had to buy into that I could believe I actually could make that shift. And the simplest little thing that was causing me the most grief was what the hell was I going to call the new podcast? But as soon as I believed that I deserved to have something new, a new platform, a new direction to expand my business, literally within a week, the name of the podcast came to us. Yeah. And I think it was because you have to thing. step into that thing. And that's what I'm hearing it's an you say. Thing. Like it, for me, it was literally overnight. It's funny to think about because I would have sooner believed that I would have been abducted by aliens because of how quickly the turnaround happened. I literally, like, I had a show in New York and it would have been, you know, like a regular run-of-the-mill show had I not lost a dancer. Like, literally, I had a dancer that just stopped coming to rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And like no explanation, no nothing. He just stopped coming. And to this day, I, I have no idea why he stopped coming. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. I had no time to focus on that. I had to train someone else up to do this New York show mm -hmm. and to get everything ready. And I did the show in New York. And the show was sort of the first step for me in, in seeing like this change because right after that everything else changed like all of the other shit that I was dealing mm -hmm. with just started to change like I was having issues with producers and that sort of like went out the window and my next few shows just sort of they just lined up and the show was already together because of all of the drama that I had with this missing dancer and it literally turned around like from one day to the next mm -hmm. day it was completely different and it's been mm -hmm. that way ever since you know what I mean this was just a few months ago, you know, to talk to me in June, we'll say to talk to me now, two completely different people just based on perspective. So I'm curious, Billy, I mean, I know it's probably you're human, just like the rest of us. So there's probably got to be days that it's not easy. But what keeps you in this new frame of mind now? What's some of the stuff that you do to keep yourself there? Honestly, the thing that keeps me in the new in this new frame of mind is finally being able to maneuver within my career. Mm -hmm. That's huge for me. And I know for a lot of people, 
that's probably not the answer that they want to hear. Well, but, but I think it is because we get a lot of people who are listening, you know, even though this is fairly new the direction we're taking, we have a lot of people who've listened in the past who are people who are not only coming out of the closet, you know, to be gay, lesbian or whatever, but they're also coming out of closets about, I need a new career thing. And I think that piece right there is when you feel stifled. In fact, when I go and do work in, you know, corporate culture work and stuff like that, that's part of it. Your people are feeling stifled. And if they don't feel stifled, they don't. And I love the way you phrase that. You feel like you can maneuver in your career now. If you didn't feel like you could do that, then artistically it holds you back. You know, your confidence gets held back. Your belief in yourself gets crushed. You know, everything gets crushed if you don't feel like you can maneuver in your life. Yeah. And that's exactly how I felt for a really, really long time. You know, like I always had a really, for as long as I've been public, we'll say, I've mm-hmm. had a very clear vision of who I am as an artist mm-hmm. and what it is that I want to present to the world. But the frustration that I felt constantly was people aren't receiving it. And what I've learned mm-hmm. over the years is the reasons why people weren't receiving it. You know, again, I always related back to myself. I didn't feel like I was as good as I had been told that I was or that I thought I was. When that wasn't really the case, it was just really, you know, there are so many external factors when you do something like this. And persistence is always key. It's something that you can show people better than you can tell them. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you can't put the words to it, but the expression and the actions is what really can help people see, oh, okay, now I get what they were trying to do. Yeah. Like with Crash, the biggest response that I've been getting from people is, oh my God, like I really didn't know how talented you were. Mm -hmm. Which on one hand, (laughs) which oh, I have really like irritates me a little. Because Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, where the hell have you been for Mm -hmm. the last five fucking years when I was performing, (laughs) like doing these shows and like, you know, being an underground pop artist and, you know, Mm -hmm. obnoxiously posting to my Instagram and social media. But then at the same time, I'm also very thankful and grateful that people finally get it, that they're paying attention and they see and they hear what it is that I've been trying to show the world since I released my first record. Mm. But don't you think some of the challenge, this is just so consistent through whoever I talk to, clients I have, companies I work with. I think the consistent challenge is, I hate to say it, we're all born with all the confidence in the world until we start to hear people. And then when we're told, no, you can't do that, no, you can't be that. And then, of course, and I know, you know, you had trouble being bullied just like most of us who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender did. Then suddenly you add that layer of stuff onto it, but you don't even have to put the sexuality piece onto this. I think most people, and I would say probably hundred percent of people, if they'd really be truthful, we all carry that little Samsonite luggage around with us or Gucci bag or whatever you want to call it that says, I'm not good enough. I'm just not good enough. And until we come to terms with that and we love it and we say that's not true and we are capable of really truly asking the question, how true is that? Then a lot of what we put out is exactly what we're going to get back. And I think I think that the average person looks at confidence as a bad thing. Right. And or something that's not achievable. Well, see, it, for me, it's like if I say to you that I'm good at what I do, mm-hmm. then depending on how you feel about yourself, that could mm-hmm. seem as though I'm bragging or that I'm being arrogant or that I'm boasting when mm-hmm. really it's a statement of fact. You right. know what I mean? I've been doing this my entire life. I've seen that what I do, the effect that it has on other people. Mm-hmm. And so based on that data, I'm saying, okay, yes, I am good at this. That doesn't mean that I am boasting or that I'm being arrogant. It's just a statement of fact. But I'm also very confident in myself through many, many, many different Mm -hmm. experiences that I've had in my life. And I think that with people, with average, you know, the average person, I always personally separate creative individuals from everyone else, because I think that creative individuals tend to see the world very differently. 
And so myself being a creative individual and talking to average people, it was always this thing of like, they just didn't understand it. And they always seemed like they wanted to diminish how I felt about myself when the reality of it was, and, and this is something that I've, again, last two years that I've discovered, they don't have the confidence in themselves. It's not exactly it's them. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, one of the things I say fairly frequently on this podcast is what somebody says is all about them. What you hear is all about you. I think that kind of wraps everything you just set up. It's like, I can say, I know I'm a really good podcast host because I go into this unscripted. I listen, I move the conversation along. I believe I'm really good at making people feel comfortable. Some people could hear that and go, Oh my God, he's such an arrogant asshole. And the truth is I'm just saying what I know to be true, what I've been told to be true. I've had numerous guests say the same thing. Wow. You're really good. You make us feel comfortable you move the conversation in directions that just make sense. You don't, you know, da, 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 da. So when you know that to be true, I'm not tooting my own horn, just stating a fact. As you said, I'm stating the facts. This is what I've been told. And I think people misconstrue that so often or, oh, that's, you know, arrogance or cockiness or whatever it is. Now, if I said, well, you know, I'm one of the best podcasters out there. I'm one of the top ones. You know, I've been told numerous times, why aren't you number one? Which I agree, I really should be number one. That's a whole different conversation. That's a whole bunch of stuff going on there that's really about arrogance and cockiness versus confidence. But when you put that other piece into it and you start to realize, and this is for the listeners to really, I hope they really get this piece, part of uncloseting yourself to live your truest life is having the confidence to see yourself in your truest light and be proud of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's weird because like I always, wonder why and how people are where they are whether they are successful or not and true enough if you stick around that individual mm-hmm. long enough you will see why they are where they are wow that's yes. why they are either successful or yep. unsuccessful absolutely and it always comes down to how they view the world for one thing but then how they view themselves as a mm-hmm. part of that world mm-hmm. yep it's their own internal blueprint. You know, it's their map of the world. That's it's kind of a NLP sort of thing, that neuro-linguistic programming. But you can learn to relate to someone. As soon as you understand their map of the world, then you can relate and you can pretty much get them to do anything you want to do. But you got to come at them where their map of the world is. And if that map of the world is, I'm no good, I'm not talented, then you kind of meet them there. But that's, you know, as a coach, that's where I move people to. It's like, okay, so let me meet you there, but let me meet you just one little step higher than where you're at. Then you can move forward. And I'm so glad you brought that up because it's that piece of really seeing yourself for who you are that begins to change everything. It's the bottom line. Absolutely. So as you know, this podcast is Life on Closet. And one of the things I always like to ask someone is, What's the thing that you feel like you've most uncloseted yourself from that you're most proud of? I would have to say in the context of the conversation that we're having, the thing that I'm, I feel like I've closeted myself from was really diminishing who I am for other people. Mm-hmm. Because I found that even when I do that, it doesn't change their perception of me. Mm-hmm. So I think that for me, It has been, you know, owning 100,000% who I am, the Mm -hmm. bad and indifferent, and always trying to present that individual to the world and doing so knowing that it doesn't matter who you are or how you present yourself because people are going to form their opinion on you no matter what. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And so I think that that's the biggest thing for me is, Staying true to myself and who I am as a person, as an artist, as a being sort of in moving through this universe and making sure that I'm not diminishing myself for the sake of others or altering who I see myself as or who I'm trying to become because of how other people view me or how I want other people to view me. Gotcha. So if you could leave one piece of advice for our listeners on how they could go live their life on closet, which I think you kind of just said it all in that last bit, but if you could leave a piece of advice for 
how they can uncloset themselves, what would you encourage someone to do? Every single moment of every single day, you can be someone different. If you don't like the person that you are right now, then in the very next moment, you can start to take steps to be someone else. It doesn't have to be today I'm Jane and tomorrow I'm Emily. Like it doesn't have to be that drastic of a change. It could be if that's what you want, but it could be something small like maybe you take that different way to work because you want to see what's down that street or maybe you switch from from caffeinated to decaffeinated. Like whatever the right. small little steps are that you can take if you choose to be someone else, you have every moment of every day to do it. Tomorrow you could be someone different if that's what you want. That's an awesome way to wrap up the show. And, you know, Billy, I just want to say best of luck with everything. We'll have the song and the videos and everything connected here for everyone to see and just keep going out there and crashing your world exactly the way you're doing, my friend. Really appreciate it. Thanks, you. Rick. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Totally man. appreciate it. And that's it. That's a wrap. Another episode of Life Uncloseted has come to an end. But don't worry, we'll be back in just a couple of days with another episode with new guests, new tips, new tricks, new wisdom about how you can go live your life uncloseted. And you know what? A lot of people out there may not even know we exist. So if you feel so compelled, share us. Tell people about it. Give us a rating and review on iTunes. Share it from your phone wherever you can. Spread the word because the more people that we reach, the better the planet will be when everybody is living their life uncloseted. I'm Rick Clemens, the host of the show, that big, bold move expert and that guy that constantly wants to help people step out, step up and step into living their life uncloseted. Have a great couple of days, everyone, and we will be right back with you very, very soon. Take care.